Hi guys, I analyzed the video a couple of months ago and then I simply shelved it because I ran out of steam. But I think it's important that we go, we, we analyze, we look and we try and understand why it is that theists believe what they believe. And since I am usually focusing on, on Islam and, and on Allah and Muhammad and all this, I'm looking at a debate, of, of, of well a video of a debate actually, between Edward or Eddie Tabash, a US lawyer, a man without any God belief, and Mohammed Hijab, a, a, I don't know what he is, a Muslim apologist. And this was organized by some Muslim students in California. And this was already on the 10th of April, 2019. And the title of the debate was, Does God Exist? Now, the, the comment here, this, I'm sorry, this will not just be a quickie, okay, which could have been done because the hijab case is easily refuted and what Eddie brings up is, is also, not, there's nothing new here. But I want to deliver some background information and I, I want to show, I, I don't just want to ridicule him, okay, which is incredibly easy, but I also want to show why I reject all his arguments. So I'm not catering for short attention span, guys, I'm sorry, and I will not put the juicy bits at the front. So if you enjoy this kind of thing, sit back, get the popcorn, and I will watch a video for you so that you don't have to. Now, in my eyes, these debates are actually like they're useless because there's been no good reasons to believe gods exist and this has been for the last what 50 odd thousand years so the question whether they can exist is futile and we should concentrate more on the ideas postulated and the the threats uttered in the name of these gods and how we can adapt and integrate them today the 21st century into society today in the 21st century and because Muslim apologists in particular are extremely bad at bringing rational and coherent arguments to the table, they're extremely easy to refute and will actually be ridiculed since what they bring up is so incredibly weak. So if someone does then refute them, well, then they apply censorship, like here. A comment I made just above someone writing what Edward Tabash said didn't make any sense at all. Now, this is something that the, they like and this is allowed. But then a bit later, you can see my comment, which I made. If I log out and, and look at the same video again, my comment has disappeared since it should be just above what I have just quoted. So this is censorship over honest interaction. But I think we need this dialogue. It's, I think it's incredibly important that we do. But maybe it's, it's due to Islam's origin in, in ancient superstitions or the basic teachings of Islam based on threats, fear and the expectation of total obedience. So it's no surprise that this debate then starts off with a ritualistic rap song, a monotonous recitation of some sentences from an old book using a dead language read by a man, and this is quite funny, read by a man in 7th century attire, complete with a beard and a dress, reading from a 21st century iPhone. <clears throat> okay, it's about, and what he's reading is, is, is about a black slave who gives advice to his son, like not to be arrogant and, and not to boast, uh, not to raise your voice and things like that. Now, it's strange that Muhammad Hijab has never come across this advice or maybe he simply ignores his God because his performance is a lot about screaming, shouting and being arrogant. And okay, please note, I am perfectly okay with taking good advice from the Quran. I don't only pick the negative even though the good stuff is hard to find. Also, I'm really trying to be factual, trying not to sound arrogant, dismissive or even supercilious, even though I've watched the entire debate and the horrendous performance by Hijab. It's a pity he concentrates more on his acting and his strutting and, <laughs> and the content. So it's quite hilarious at best. But what, what can I do with this debate, okay? Hijab is really not good at this. His arguments are weak, his attitude is arrogant, his claims are dishonest and he can't even sing. So what can I say that is not dismissive or that does not ridicule him? Anyway, what I'm commenting is a debate, okay, not the, not the people. And in this debate, ancient old arguments that have been regurgitated multiple times are brought up as though they are something special. 
And now I'm, I'm doing this mainly for Muslim apologists to see how easy this kind of a performance can be dismantled, regardless of how much hijab is, is you know, he's being praised by the presenter in the introduction and by his followers and what a eloquent, wonderful guy he is. Well, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't agree with you. So let, let's listen to what is being said and then I will comment on this. Now, after something like eight minutes into the video, Hijab's boyfriend Ali Dawa makes some wild claims further demonstrating exactly how divisive Islam is. Now, he, he's not the sharpest, okay, and in his deluded ignorance claims that non-Muslims hate Islam, unjustifiably so, of course, and that more Islam would be beneficial for the entire planet and curbing human rights would help facilitate this. He totally ignores that 99% of all violent killings of Muslims is at the hands of other Muslims. So more Muslims is not going to help this. I don't understand how the, the, the brain functions here. I, I really don't understand it. After 14 minutes, the job takes the stage. So this is like after almost a quarter of an hour. And he delivers his, his really dated and long refuted show. His main argument, he says, his irrefutable argument, he says. This argument, I want the most undercutting argument. No one can crack this argument. I've read from Plato to Leibniz all the way through to Russell. And believe me, this is the argument no one can solve. This is the uncrackable cult. So what is this magic argument? He starts off by creating a false dichotomy what he calls necessary and possible existence. Now, this is creating a circular argument where existence as such requires a necessary God which creates this existence. It's a, it's a primitive, typical presupposition, first documented in, what, 13th century by Thomas Aquinas in his three ways. I think that's the first time this was mentioned. Hijab follows the old philosophers and he posits the idea that you need to have something outside everything to facilitate this everything, the concept of the prime mover, without concluding what this actually is, then defining an imaginary supernatural entity into existence without any good reason. If an imaginary supernatural entity can deliver purpose and existence, well then so can the universe. Skip the middleman, it's so much easier. Hijab, however, claims that his contingency is a mathematical argument, one that can't be disproven. And then he scribbles something on a board. Why? Because he calls elements a set and writes IND on top. And that's it. That's the really entirety of his <laughs> mathematical <laughs> argument. <laughs> and he creates a new symbol for infinity while he's at it. Now, what Hijab doesn't comprehend that by defining what he calls possible existence, he can also put his God into this very category because it's not necessary. Because if there was more than one necessary existence, it wouldn't be a necessary existence because it could be conceived that it could be arranged in another way. He can't conceptualize, nor can he follow his own line of thinking to contemplate the consequences. Stuck in his limited worldview and way of living is Islam, which restricts rationality and logical thinking and totally eliminates the most crucial ability of them all, critical thinking. Now his idea, of a god is only valid for human brains. No other animal has these gods, and if gods don't have anything worshipping them, what are these gods? I mean, a king without subjects is a king. Uh, no, not really. Only with subjects is a king a king. Without the subject, she's just a lonely dude. And the same goes for a god. Now, all hijab manages to present us with at, at the end of the day is just another flavor of infinite regress, okay, where some sort of prime mover is required, something that has been addressed over and over. So no need to do it again. 
his argument is not really an argument. It's a misunderstanding in a simple brainwashed human being who is a habitual liar, as I have demonstrated, and who, once again, will not fulfill his promise he made at the beginning, the promise of leaving Islam. That's done. I'm ready to be an atheist today. Next, he wants to use a cosmological example. A tree. Or so long as the tree exists, the sun will exist. And shows us how totally absurd this argument is. His summary, his interpretation of the vague and ambiguous words that the book provides him with, is the illusion of certainty. Where I am more honest and admit I don't know for sure and with 100% certainty that what I believe is correct. He doesn't have that. Saying that the atheistic position is one of... Mere speculation. You can never achieve certainty with atheism. No. The opposite of certainty is not speculation, but uncertainty or doubt. I know with a high degree of certainty that I will stop believing something if it turns out to be not true, not aligned with reality. Because of my ethics, my morality, my integrity, my authenticity, all things a Muslim apologist can't have or he or she would not be a Muslim apologist. He is stuck in a single book worldview and can only manage to drop some names of well-known non-Muslim philosophers occasionally for no reason, where I have shown in the past that he does not comprehend what they actually say and occasionally presents us with the opposite of what they write. It's actually quite embarrassing to seal this failure again and again. And in his desperation, he just limits the endless possibilities of the origin of the universe to only four options he can manage from nothing eternal self-created or it must have been put into existence. He just rejects the first one, but out of ignorance. In addition, he tries to deceive us, claiming that either the universe came from nothing, which is impossible, ontologically, math mathematically, and cosmologically. It's not possible. No one has argued this really. Yet countless cosmologists and physicists have presented exactly this option in differing variations. Addressing the second option, the eternal universe, he trips up. If it was eternal, it can't be dependent on anything, can it? But he doesn't understand that if his creator, God, and the universe are both eternal, there is no dependency that can be constructed here. He does not elaborate on why there can't be two independent, eternal entities. And I've refuted his third option several times, and any physicist will have plenty of examples where a quantum fluctuation or a time loop or whatever will demonstrate exactly that which he denies. He's been schooled on this endlessly, but will stubbornly repeat something he knows full well is not true. Is that what Islam does to a human brain? So, rejecting the three options he can conceive of, he now jumps on his desired solution. God did it. My brain is free to think, not being blocked by Islam. And I can think not only of four, but dozens of other options on the origins of the universe. And I will simply and honestly state when asked which one is most plausible, I don't know. Hijab can't do that. He wants the answer, God did it, so much that he will do anything to arrive at this conclusion. Anything. Including deceiving others and lying. Anything. Even if it involves not handing someone the £10 note he promised them. Yes or no? Yes or no? Yes or no? Yes or no? Please, I'll give you £10. No, no, I'll give you £10. That's the degree of dishonesty. Now, I will not discuss the following fallacies where he tries to force a God into existence following Christian apologists like William Lane Craig et al. This culminates in the old and tired argument for fine-tuning, also long refuted and dismissed. He misrepresents science, showing once again he doesn't understand anything scientific, yet can't stop talking about science all the time and making a mess of it. I will tell you that the only rational explanation for that is that there is an external particularizer of the universe. Say that one more time. 
that there must be an external particularizer of the universe. That's how bad this is. He seems to have forgotten that this is not about naturalism, but God's and goes on and on about a universe with certain parameters. He doesn't even understand the difference between descriptive and prescriptive. Unbelievable. Uh, what irritates me again and again is the constant conflation of naturalist and atheist. Just because I don't have a God belief does not automatically result in any other belief or non-belief or whatever. It's a recurring theme where hijab has been schooled on this, but will stubbornly repeat something he knows again. Something is not true, but he repeats it anyway. And when our little apologist can't hack it and runs out of things to say, what does he do? Ah, he sings. <laughs> like in a bad musical from the 60s. And this is not exactly... Muslims got talent, quality. Ah, oh, man, you can't make it up. And people still ask themselves whether or not Islam could fit to the 21st century of Europe. It can't. Does singing improve things? No, come on, not one bit. And he can't grasp that if a robotic human has a malfunctioning battery, several hip replacements, a nose too big and a penis too small, broken cameras, joints that wear too quickly, and a spine that collapses, this is not exactly a sign of excellent craftsmanship. When he's done singing, he continues with his inane claims. He can't understand that it is not one person who steers a ship, but a team. Now, this does not eliminate mistakes, the possibility of mistakes happening, but reduces their probability. He assigns human characteristics, primitive, selfish characteristics, etc., like to his God figure. Like most people, he misquotes Einstein, who wrote in an article in the Journal of Franklin, the fact that it is comprehensible is a miracle. He said the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it is comprehensible. And then continues to say, So I'm not making a fine-tuning argument today. And spends a lot of time here again to argue the fine-tuning argument. Stephen Hawkins accepted it. Richard Dawkins accepted it. So it's not really an area of controversy. Making several false statements about people accepting fine-tuning, he knows is false, but says it anyway. Given that, it is still a terrible argument. It is not at all convincing. I will give you five quick reasons why theism does not offer a solution to the purported fine-tuning problem. First, I am by no means convinced that there is a fine-tuning problem. And again, Dr. Craig offered no evidence for it. It is certainly true that if you change the parameters of nature, our local conditions that we observe around us would change by a lot. I grant that quickly. I do not grant that therefore life could not exist. I will start granting that once someone tells me the conditions under which life can exist. What is the definition of life, for example? He starts preempting what Eddie Tabash will say and makes some blatant mistakes here, like saying Fitra has empirical evidence. In reality, this consists of sheer emotions, confirmation bias, and wishful thinking. It's projection and hope, but nothing more. And we'll talk about this, by the way, the Fitra, the immediate knowledge of God, because there is empirical evidence of that. By the way, Justin Barrett made an interesting, has many interesting books on this. He says that there, there, is, a, a, there is a divine receptivity to God. And he done, you know, studies with children cross-culturally and found that children naturally believe in God. He blindly follows what Barrett and Petrovich postulated, ignoring that Barrett, who never conducted any real study on this, and when confronted by philosopher A.Z. Grayling, master of the new College of the Humanities, he had to back down and state that he did not even say that religion is hardwired or innate. Rather, that children have propensities to believe in gods because of how their minds naturally work. And, oh sorry, and that was end quote. Okay, this is what he said. I did not say that religion is hard white or innate. Rather, children have propensities to believe in gods because of how their minds work. This is what Barrett eventually had to admit. And he also had to admit this, and this is another quote, real reasons for thinking this, of course, aren't that I am a man of faith, funded by a faith-based organization, end quote. So he admits that he is a man of faith, that he was funded by a faith-based organization, and that was the real reason for thinking this for him. 
So all we have is the fact that children are prone to thinking processes based on a function and purpose. You know, like, why do we have trees? Well, so that, you know, birds can sit on them. That's the way a child works, the brain of a child. And a real study actually reveals that children only follow their parents when it comes to the supernatural. So we see that this is just another claim that hijab makes and that it is totally false. And I've, 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 done, I've made a short version of a video explaining this Fitra Kids and Belief in Gods on the, on the Dabo Response Team channel. Now hijab closes with singing and then pleading the signs mentioned in the Quran will never be inspected, just blindly accepted. Then after a good half an hour, Eddie Tabash comes on and I'm not going to spend too much time there because I, I, I think his line of reasoning is, is totally rational, logical and, and I think we all know about this. So right from the start he points out that this is not a reply and this is very good that he does this, but he, he points out that this is his own opening statement because he didn't know um, what was going to be said because people, like, I've, I've done this as well. I've offered to share my own argument so that, you know, we can both prepare. But this was rejected. And I suppose this happened here too. So he couldn't know anything what was going to be said by hijab. So he, this is his own opening statement. And he just makes a case for naturalism. And he does so convincingly, okay? He points out logical flaws when inspecting the God claims and demonstrate why the gods, as, as claimed in Islam, can't exist. So he goes into, and, and here's a list, chaotic random universe, miracles, conscious, physical. So he, he opens up eight, eight different points. Then after 53 or almost 54 minutes, hijab does his, what he calls a rebuttal. And again, <laughs> he makes a claim, a promise he will not keep. He will answer each and every one of the points made. All right, so Edward made eight um, points, eight arguments. I'm going to respond to each and every single one of them. And starts by skipping point number one, because he doesn't even comp he doesn't address the chaotic random universe where there is no evidence of gods or supernatural entities. He just skips it because he can't find anything to refute that with because that's the way that it is and he uses yet does not understand the verb to prove and when he doesn't know what to say he again starts singing when he's done he makes a really stupid claim namely that science presupposes a biogenesis every study of biology presupposes this which is not the case at all the, the, I mean, the, the theory of evolution is based on a, on a book which is called The Origin of Species, not The Origin of Life. So, yes, there are strong indications that a, a biogenesis is actually something or, or is what actually happened. But until it is reliably demonstrated, we, and I hope so, I at least, remain agnostic on this. But hijab is not scientifically educated and he can't stop talking about science. It's quite weird. So he's making a total fool of himself every time he does, but he will not stop. He even digs himself deeper by stating that without this transition to organic matter, there can be no biology. What nonsense. Hijab believes in talking ants and flying donkeys, but tries to ridicule someone for a belief they don't hold. Plus, in his ignorance and emotional rather than fact-based approach, he brings in the resurrection claim by Christians, which is useless when talking to someone without a God belief. But hijab is not too jacked up, and he brings this up anyway, showing his level of desperation all too vividly. So he failed to address points one and two, so what does he do with number three? Uh, it makes me shake my head, really. Because we can't pinpoint the exact molecules responsible for consciousness, we need to make up a God who does everything through magic? Really, is that all he can come up with? Because that's what he does. He says we can't pinpoint consciousness. We don't know where it sits in the brain, so we can't assume it's in the brain. It's, it's, it's crazy. And then, you know, it, no, it's, it's, it's ridiculous because this is just repeating the facts around the good old, you know, the God of the gaps argument. 
we as mankind don't yet know the origin of the universe, the origin of life and the origin of consciousness. Yes, I freely admit this. But why, just because I don't know or understand something, why would I now stick a God doing magic in there and stop thinking? Why isn't this for hijab or for other Muslim apologists an incentive to roll up my sleeves and go out and find out what the origin of something is? Why not start thinking instead of leaving this to others? And then after 57 minutes, confronted with biological evolution, a scientific theory contradicting the manual creation of human beings, hijab once again demonstrates his ignorance. Just like Tzortzis, he doesn't really understand embryology, like Subua doesn't really understand evolution, and Hijab doesn't really understand anything regarding science, and very little regarding philosophy. So that's why he keeps on dropping names which are totally irrelevant. Now, for me, it's a question, why doesn't his God reveal itself? Wouldn't this God, instead of letting these guys make complete idiots of themselves, rather take over and stop them embarrassing it if it existed because they are doing this in the name of islam they are you know muttering things towards their god and then make this god look like a bumbling idiot <laughs> anyway hijab demonstrates his woeful lack of knowledge and starts shouting at the microphone without being able to refute any argument and volume and screaming doesn't change anything. Now, Eddie's number five um, argument, the, let me just quickly look it up, was this oh, the, the argument from evil. Um, he, he, he totally ignores it. it. He misrepresents it. And he just creates a simple straw man as he was not arguing for naturalism, but the existence of a God. Hijab fails yet again. He does not address the point and instead, yeah, he starts singing and then shows us how illogical his beliefs are where an all-powerful, all-knowing, perfect God creates humans who then require testing. Where the God, this, this creator God, knows in advance the result of this test. Really? For question number six, he goes back to his deceptive and false nonsense he's already provided, not addressing the question at all. He pretends he has no access to the internet and can't investigate the thousands of pages, all showing unreliable parts in the Quran. He pretends they don't exist and does not address the question. And then he claims that 434, in other words, Quran chapter 4, sentence number 34, is just a bad translation. No, it is not about women being the same as men. It is about the violation of human rights where 50% of the population is lowered and considered to be lesser than the other half. And hijab has no answer to seven, simply skips over it, making a strawman remark, nothing more. He doesn't understand number eight and runs from it, ending his reply and in summary, not being able to answer a single question posed by Eddie Tabash. Oh well, does he now leave Islam as he promised in the beginning? <laughs> yeah. After just over an hour, we get the rebuttal by Eddie Tabash to what hijab came up with. And Eddie Tabash immediately recognizes the problems with hijab's contingency crap. He points out that a supernatural being outside of time and space has no way of interacting with time and space. He also points out the problem with the infinite regress that this is something we know, we know how to handle, and that this is not an exclusion or an argument. He deconstructs all the arguments regarding a benign deity, reinforces the claim around consciousness without a physical brain, as well as his previous points, which were not by dress, addressed by hijab, showing why this particular God can't exist. And this is end of part one. In part two, which is the cross-examination questions, which is about one hour, then we have hijab with naturalism and objective morality. And again, hijab forgets that the debate is about gods, not naturalism, which he has abundantly demonstrated by now. He simply doesn't understand what the, what the talk is about. And Eddie's answer is 
reasoning. Better than looking in one old book allowing us to understand what we are doing. He also points out that claiming objective God-based morality to show that the existence of objective morality shows that a God must exist. Of course, this is circular. And of course, my question is, do gods condemn or condone sex lives? Now, the next thing hijab says is on atheistic naturalism. Can you prove mathematics? Oh, goodness. All right, this is total nonsense. Now, there is no such thing as theistic and atheistic naturalism, okay? And the debate is not on naturalism. And science doesn't care about beliefs. So naturalism does not care about beliefs either. Plus, mathematics is a concept, not a natural occurrence. Is that really so difficult? Uh, and Eddie elegantly demonstrates how empiricism can demonstrate the veracity of something. What was not elegant is a shot of Ali Dawa exploring his nose and eating the findings. Hijab continued his quest to ask every possible question on naturalism, even the absurd. And I must admit, I did not understand some of the questions and I would have been unable to answer them. But I fully understood Eddie's answer and then after listening again, saw the attempt at a question. But I had to listen to it several times. And in my eyes, though, this was not a line of questioning in order to gain knowledge, but to somehow ask absurd questions in order to embarrass Eddie and his inability to answer, creating a gotcha moment. You know, a gotcha, a gotcha. This is all that hijab wants. He, he is doing everything as, as, as in a performance. He performs for his crowd. And all he wants to do is be able to say, you see, I got him. I got him to say something that he didn't like. I got him to say something he doesn't really believe. I don't know what, what, what he gets out of it. Then we have the changeover in questions and then um, Eddie comes back to his 434 where men in charge can beat if the man only fears disobedience. And does Hijab agree with this? Hijab does not answer the question. He only whines about the translation, making it worse. And in the translations, we see the real consensus, the beating, spanking or hitting. Not at all what hijab claims. It shows his total lack of respect towards women. If adding that they should be beaten lightly or verbally admonished, come on, this increases the emotional abuse, the condescending treatment of women like bad little girls, where the pasha in the house is the lord and women must serve and cater for his whimsical needs. It's disgusting. It shows once again why Islam in its current form does not and cannot fit into the 21st century. If the Islamic God would exist as an all-merciful and benign God, there would be a sentence saying don't harm or abuse females, full stop. But it doesn't. Eddie then asks, why is the Quran valid? Why does it contain all these claims like this? inimitable, that is preserved, that it has predictions, that there is a falsification, that's the linguistic miracle, all nonsense, and each has been refuted. So the answer why the Quran is more valid is because the Quran says so at the end of the day. And then Eddie asks, how, not why, how was everything created? There's no info. There's no reply. He just, this is just babbling, okay? When just a few minutes ago, he demanded a detailed process description if we accept naturalism. But he can't provide the same when it is asked of him. So, in all, a highly unsatisfactory Q&A session because, again, Hijab could not address any challenge from reality. Then we get to the audience questions. The Muslim organizers don't allow free questioning, I guess, since this might embarrass each other, something we've seen in other debates. So they pre-select questions in writing only. And one is, why is God hiding? And I mean, this was already addressed, but hijab still manages to make it a mess, creating a straw man. Atheists focus on, and I don't understand what he says, so I can't even comment the answers. 
Why do we have bad design? Hijab has no idea what is being asked. He just waffles. And then Tabash addresses the question perfectly. What evidence would you require? Eddie brings examples, stressing that he, as an atheist, is open to change when presented with compelling evidence. Hijab doesn't get it. He once again mixes atheist with science. It's bizarre. As a scientist, I can go and verify data, process and conclusion. That's what peer review is all about. But Hijab can't. He must rely on the single source of Messenger Muhammad and what he claimed was revealed to him, even if it was only highly beneficial for his bank account or his sex life or whatever. But Hijab must believe ants can speak classical Arabic and that a corpse can be revived by slapping it with a piece of steak without the chance of ever verifying any one of these claims, no matter how absurd. And does free will negate the good evil argument? Hijab claims that without evil one can't decide on anything. That's outright crazy. If I drive down a highway, the exits are usually only on one side and I can decide where I want to turn off without the necessity of another option on the opposite side. Aside from good and good, there has to be good and bad. And therefore, you must be tested. A test makes no sense with the, existence, with the non-existence of evil. Testing makes no sense if the outcome is known in advance. And hijab is incredibly naive and cruel. He says Hitler will be tortured eternally to punish him for killing six million Jews. Sorry, individuals, he says. But, Mr. Hijab, so will I. I'm going to be tortured eternally for the crime of using my brain. That's why I don't believe the Islamic God exists. It's due to the internal discrepancies, the illogical claims. And Eddie is more concise and, and honest, actually. He shows very clearly that the contradiction between the attributes of the Islamic God makes it a monster and not something we should worship, whether we have this strange concept of free will or not. Islam provides objective morality, is the claim. Do you believe objective morality exists? Why did atheists 30 years ago object to homosexuality? Now, I don't know whether the person asking this was drunk or not. The last bit is mood, since I was an atheist 30 years ago and I did not object to homosexuality since it meant more girls for me. But since an atheist has only one opinion, and that is regarding the existence of gods, the question is actually quite stupid. And accepting homosexuality is not determined by God belief, but compassion. And the answer Eddie provides is more soft, but way more eloquent. Well, he's the lawyer. Islam allows sex slaves, but most Muslims today don't keep slaves at all. Muhammad, at least according to Islamic sayings, declared as authentic by Islamic scholars, and this is Muhammad the Prophet, okay? Not Muhammad teacher. So in, in authentic hadiths, encouraged his men to enjoy raping female captives before selling them on the slave market. Something Muslims today don't usually do. Well, ISIS did, but they're not around anymore. <laughs> not so much anyway. But this shows how morality changes and how we are a product of our time and what culture we are exposed to in which society. And he, he job uses words he doesn't really understand, like epistemology. This, no, he, he tries to explain how religions and their respective gods can't be held accountable for all atrocities, something which is not being claimed. Now, Hijab argues that incest should be allowed in social liberalism, something that is not being claimed. What he does not do is answer the question what objective morality he can gain from Islam regarding homosexuality. And by the way, the look of disgust on the faces of two girls who could well be Muslims shows just how few Muslims actually know what the Quran says and that it explicitly allows incest. Muslims are shocked to find out that sex with a cousin is A. Allowed in Islam and B. Considered to be incest outside of Islam. And then, oh boy, I don't know why this always has to come up. Pascal's wager, another nonsensical question and not even a question at all. I would have rejected it. Then we get the closing statements where um, Islam is political and 99% can be explained by naturalism today. He admitted that 99% of things natural science can explain. 
That means 1% of things are supernatural. That means miracles are possible. So according to Hijab, 1% is supernatural and miracles are possible. Really? I mean, it's like a child. The frantic applause by his fanboys demonstrates what level of intellect we're dealing with here. It only states that 1% can't be explained through naturalism. If I tell you don't turn left does not mean turn right. Is hijab really this thick? The cosmological argument, Ghazali's argument that William Lane Craig and those other guys are making popular now in this country, it's Ghazali's argument. Is the cosmological argument by Ghazali? No. It goes back to Greek and Christian philosophers and people like Al-Kindi. And the Kalam, the speech, the Kalam itself might be traced back to Ghazali, who incidentally was totally unconvinced by the argument itself. The attributes of components does not necessarily describe the whole thing, the components form. So just because one statement in a book is correct, does not make every statement in the book correct. But just because hijab constantly drops the names of philosophers, does not mean he actually understands what they are saying. And Russell and Hume, and this shows the childish level of comprehension by hijab, voice concern by using the fallacy of composition when inspecting the cosmological argument, the very same argument hijab is using and throwing in the composition fallacy at the same time. Now my main problem, however, is the fallacy is the claim, not the attributes themselves. All this shows that he has a very superficial understanding of philosophers and doesn't really understand what they are saying, something I've pointed out several times already, where he actually says they say the opposite of what they are saying. All he, he does is repeat things we know are wrong, which does not make them right. But he delivers his nonsense with confidence, impressive but rather useless. He claims that his God is necessary. Why would he do that? I can say with confidence that his God does not exist. Both statements carry the same amount of valid information. Both situations are possible. I've argued my case and listed I don't know, 50 criteria showing why this God does not exist. And his evidence? You are born with that feeling of believing in a God. You're born with that feeling of believing in God. Really? All he has is this feeling that substitutes the inability of detection of any one of them. And he jumps, says we need to be honest. So why isn't he? One example of how dishonest he is is here when he's presenting his irrefutable evidences. That the Romans had been defeated in low land, nearby land. And after that defeat, they will become victorious. Now this, this shows how he deceives listeners who are led to think that the Quran accurately describes a place where it does no such thing. The word can have a variety of meanings as is shown by hijab who simply states low and nearby as two possibilities of the same word. Where factually lowest would be wrong as no battle ever took place that was in the lowest part of the planet or the region. And the nearest of what place of reference? The Quran is horribly vague and ambiguous, which is why this can't possibly be a prediction on, or, or a prophecy. And on top of that, the, the next part only happened allegedly a few years later. So it can't be a prophecy or a prediction, like me predicting that a Hollywood actor would one day be a US president. That's not a prediction, is it? So this can't possibly be considered as being evidence for anything because a US president who was an actor has already been a president. So it's not a prediction. It makes predictions which materialize. He next comes up with some nonsense once again. No, I today, as would countless others, I'm sure, would be immensely impressed to see the moon split into two halves move about without collapsing due to gravity and then being joined up again. Imperfectly, by the way, so that some rules are visible, but nevertheless, a miracle. But it does not happen today. So all we have is claims and more claims, no evidence. And then Eddie starts off his closing comments with correcting hijab's mistakes, showing how primitive and flawed his idea of independent and contingent elements really is. 
He also explains very patiently how hijab totally misunderstood his 99% naturalistic explanations part. The record for the predictions claim is also set straight at precisely zero. Tabash is actually mistaken as a codified Quran was only released in 1924 in Cairo. In his remaining time, Eddie totally dismantles hijab, showing some of hijab's inconsistencies and where he failed to address the points raised. Eddie now proceeds to single-handedly deconstruct Islam and the Quran. He totally annihilates all common arguments and destroys any good reason why someone would believe the Islamic God exists. And the sentence of the day is, what is true, what's true is not, is not what, not what we, we would, would like, like to be true, true but what's what true cold, is what cold hard, hard reality, reality shows, shows is, true. is true. That could be my motto. So, personal thoughts. The positive thing is, there were no takbiyas, there was no interruption. Everybody was allowed to, to have their say. There was no gender segregation. Very, very good. The negative part is that I don't know, it was a shaky video, audio bits missing and, and cutting out, and it was below par camera placement and operation. But what was often the center of attraction for the cameraman were some men in beards with funny hats and long dresses. They were shown quite often. So Islam doesn't fit into the 21st century that we can see and we can rebut the claims made in the Quran and we could actually expect Muslims to be honest, to admit the failures of this book, so obviously written by humans over a thousand years ago, somewhere in what we call the Middle East today. Thanks and talk to you next time.